right, welcome back for the next talk. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce a colleague here from Heidelberg, a local colleague, uh, Julio Sars Rodriguez. Uh, Julio arrived uh, about one and a half years ago, or? Already over two. Over two? Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. well, time flies. All right. <laughs> and um, he will uh, go back to the topic of the heart, actually. So we're talking about myocardial infarction, but then at a spatial and single cell resolution. So we are looking very much forward to your talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph, uh, for the invitation to present him today and for organizing this workshop. Uh, it's always a lot of work and, of course, much more than the current situations. And also congratulations to everyone involved that so far things working really smoothly. So, as Christoph said, uh, I will in a way come back to some of the things we heard about yesterday in the context of molecular characterization uh, of the heart. And as those working uh, in the heart know much better than me, we have improved a lot our understanding and the options to treat heart failure and uh, in particular yeah, the treating of molecular infection, but still it's a major cause of death and in particular uh, the process of cardiac remodeling is very important but only partially understood in particular the molecular level. So we do know that there is the of myocytes, that inflammatory signals are activated, that they are put down, myofas get activated, and so on. But still we have only a limited knowledge of how this works, and in particular directly in humans. So how about we try to learn more about this? So yesterday, Norbert Hupner gave a very nice talk, uh, showing us how we can use single cell RNA, and in particular single nuclear RNA seq to characterize individual cells. And this can be done from archive materials, from, from people. Uh, and this is a very powerful technology, but there are others we can try to use to complement it. In particular, we can use ATAXIC, which ATAX stands for Singular Nuclear Assay of Transposase Accessible Chromatin. So what this technology will tell us is about the epigenetic regulation of cells, also at the single cell level, and in a way can tell us about the potential transcriptional uh, profiles that individual cells will, will achieve in the future. And another technology that has become recently available is spatial transcriptomics, where we can look at the RNA uh, in the spatial context of, of the tissue. And here actually at the moment there are different technologies with pros and cons. Some can give us the really single cell resolution, but only two markers, like the RNA scope that Norbert used in his uh, work showed yesterday, or the VCU technology, that is what uh, talk about today, where you do get a good coverage of things, but you don't get actual single cell resolution, so you get these very small spots where you have around 10 different cells, and as I will discuss later, this has uh, interesting challenges, but also is quite powerful. So then what we try to do is to apply these technologies to understand myocardial infarction and cardiac remodeling, and this is uh, the work I will show you is done by uh, Ricardo Ramirez, Giovanni Taneski, and Monica Anani in the lab. But it's a very close, great collaboration with other labs, in particular with Rafael Kaman in Aachen and Christoph Kupe in his lab, generating experimental data. The lab of Juan Costa, also in Aachen, who did uh, part of the bioinformatics, especially in the taxi analysis. And Henrik Mir thinking back on how to provide the uh, samples. So then, what we have here is from different uh, patients as well as controls, uh, different uh, slices or different props of, of the heart, and we have these different zones. The heart. So we have the ischemic zone where, where the ischemia has taken place. We also have uh, the remote zone, which is, let's say, healthy light zones, as well as intermediate border zone. And you can see this figure in the middle of the different uh, slides where they place in the zone and for which patients. And we complement this with two patients that did not suffer from acute myocardial infarction, but instead they had a chronic disease and therefore had no chronic tissue. So we have these wonderful data sets. Another challenge, but also the exciting part of bioinformatics group like us, is how can we make the most out of this. So what we work on is to try to apply the development methods to extract from this data uh, different types of insights, and in particular how we can improve the resolution of the vision technology that, as I told you, is not really single cell, how we can extract mechanistic knowledge about the underlying cellular processes, but also how we explore this information that we have about who is a neighbor of who as a way to better understand what's happening by learning about different patient, uh, patterns in the space as well as the uh, interactions among the cells. So 
the first thing is how you can use increase the resolution of the vision by using the other single cell technologies. So for this, what we did is first to cluster and annotate the single RNA seq data, and then also cluster the attack seq. So we use label transferring to, to transfer the labels from, from the RNA to the attack, and then we did a coin bedding to integrate both data types. So now we have a catalog of different cell types, both at the RNA and attack seq level. And then we transfer this to the special data, to the vision data, so that then for each of these little spots that we have in, in the tissues, we can get a cell type score, which is an estimate of how much of each of the different cell types is present on different spots in the tissues. So once we have done this, we can, on these spots, uh, try to extract the mechanistic knowledge. And uh, this uh, challenge or question of how to extract mechanistic knowledge from this data is uh, at the core of the research in our group. So it also, like Lars mentioned, the use of parties or other type of resources to extract features that then can be input to the statistical and machine learning approaches to uh, predict, or for example, the phenotype or to find new associations. And I also think of what Lars said that actually the algorithm tends to be less essential and it's actually how you use this data, how you input the algorithm, what often makes the biggest difference. So, how we go about this is that first we have put together a lot of resources into one single place. This is a resource called Omnipath, which is a one-stop shop that gives you access to over 100 different resources. These are things such as pathways or localization. And in particular, and very relevant for single cell data, we have recently included different types of information that are important to study cell-to-cell interaction, which is something that you can do very nicely with single cell data, although I will not get into much details into that today. But this resource is still available through Bioconductor, Python, or Cytoscape. So, uh, yeah, you're really welcome to use it and to give us feedback. So once we have this biological knowledge, we use to extract mechanistical signatures from different types of data, and we focus on transcriptomic, which is what I'm showing you today. And our main strategy for doing this is to think of transcriptomic as the footprint of a certain process. So if you want to understand if a pathway is active, there are methods that will look at the expression of the components of the pathway, but these pathways are built not by RNA molecules, but by proteins. So that there is more RNA, only partially will correlate with uh, more proteins, and even if a protein is there, it may or may not be active because maybe it needs to be phosphorylated or it needs to be located in a particular part of the cell. So for this reason, Instead of looking at uh, the genes in the pathway, we look at the, at the footprint of the genes, which is a method that we call progeny, that we use to estimate pathway activities. Following the similar idea to estimate the activity of transcription factors, we don't look at the expression of the, of the transcription factor itself, but instead at target genes of the transcription factor. And finally, we also develop methods to combine the absent pathways with absent transcription factors and the whole carnival that allows you to connect them into large uh, networks with defined causal paths that drive changes in gene expression. Uh, we have recently shown that this method works well with single cell RNA data. As you may know, single cell RNA data is very exciting because you look at single cells, but it's limited in, in a number of ways. And in particular, you don't really get a very good coverage of genes, so it was a question whether this would work. And this, this study here that uh, is published now. We show that these methods are robust for single cell data. And so, in summary, uh, these strategies that, as I said, think of RNA as, as a footprint of, of the process of interest can be very informative to, to understand about or to learn about the activity of certain pathways. Uh, they would work well with single cell data, even though uh, we have missing values. And even though I focus today on RNA, similar ideas can be applied to the type of data, like metabolomic or proteomic data. So now back to our uh, data on the heart and, and to the special transcriptomic data. So now we can leverage these methods to, to get some mechanistic insight of what's happening. So here is just an example of one of the chronic defibrotic tissues. So as you can see in the top right, uh, based on the earlier annotation and, and transfer learning, we identify different subtypes of fibroblasts in different zones. And you can see fibroblast 3, which is this reddish color in the middle. Now what we can do is to look uh, in the same slide and see which pathways are active, 
So we see a high level of, for example, TEA beta, which is suspected, this is a public volume fibrosis on the upper left. We can also look at certain description factors that are active. I right here uh, is an example where we actually leverage the attack seed data to identify central specific regulatory networks. And then also we can look at the target genes of these pathways as, as, as a means to further understand how the process is going. So by combining them, this integration of the different signal cell technologies and this biological knowledge, we can get some mechanistic understanding of what's happening in these tissues, uh, in, in this case, in this fibrotic heart. That was the first type of approaches I wanted to talk about, how to improve the resolution, how to get more insight into this space of transcriptomic data. Uh, but actually, all we are doing is to look at this spot at a time, see what we can learn, and so we visualize it on a special manner, but we're not really using the fact that we know which spot is the neighbor of which spot. That's the second type of analysis uh, I want to talk about now, where we really exploit the special information to learn about the tissue architecture. And there are at least two types of analysis we can do for this. So on one hand, you can try to see if there are patterns, special patterns in the data. Could be at the gene level or at the level of some of these features I just showed you now, like the pathways and prescription factors. Here there are uh, methods like SPARC or special read that one can use to look at these relationships. But one can also just try to go beyond these patterns and try to see if you can find uh, interactions between the cell types and if the specific uh, features in some of the spots are predictive of what happens in the different spots. So to try to get more around the interactions between the different places in the tissue. And for that, uh, we develop a method, uh, which is a machine learning framework based on the multi-view approach. Uh, and the idea is that you, you build different so-called views to capture different biological dimensions. So the first one would be the intrinsic view, where you look at what happened inside each of the spots. But then you combine this with a, a local view, which is around how cells or spots affect their direct neighbors. You can also look at a more broader type of distance. So do specific spots affect other spots nearby, but not immediate neighbors. And this approach can be uh, adapted to, to different type of views or to different type of questions. And also, uh, again, I will show you the spatial transcriptomic, but for example, we have used this also with imaging mass spectrometry data where you actually look at proteins that are, are there. Uh, but yeah, but the idea is that with this, this the approach, what you can do is to try to understand and estimate how much of the context explains the changes in specific places on the tissue. And, and how much these also are driven by specific uh, components and by specific molecules in the tissue. So as an example of how we apply this approach, in this case it's one of the border zone tissues on the acute uh, myocardial infarction. And what we observe first by looking at the cell types, characterization that we've done before, is that there were two types of cardiomyocytes that you can see here, this yellowish and this uh, magenta-like color. And then uh, what we did is to apply this approach, Misty, and try to see are there specific markers uh, that explain uh, the location of, of these different subtypes. And so we found one that is uh, predictive uh, in a pure machine learning sense, so that's in, you know, it's causal or it's based on more correlations, but uh, the presence of these thrombos bodies is very predictive of these cardio, cardio, cardiomyocytes, the type 2, that we have seen actually that they are associated with this medium. So we thought that was interesting. And then um, to kind of further support this hypothesis, what we did is to check with another data set that we have recently generated. It's called RIHIP. And it's a consensus transcriptional landscape of human in stage heart failure. So what we did here is take public bulk RNA data sets from different studies. Uh, 16 different studies, and we analyze them all together uh, in a way that we can compare them, that we can look at differentials in different contexts. We can also apply the tools I showed you before, around pathways, and prescription factors, and so on. But we do this with the aim to derive more general signatures of our failure, and also we, we validate the independent data sets, so this is available in a meta archive, actually, in the bioarchive uh, paper, and it's also shiny app that you can use to browse the data. 
And this is also what we did ourselves. So we went to look in, in these data sets if this uh, gene that we found to be predictive for this specific subtype of cardiomyocytes, if it's uh, differential expressed, and we did see that across the different data sets is uh, overexpressed, so this kind of gives indirect support that uh, given that we saw this cardiomyocyte type to be important uh, in disease, that it could be an interesting thing to look at some detail, but also like what Lars said earlier, these methods are really hypothesis generation, so this thing needs to be taken further, but this is just one example of how we can try to combine uh, these different dedicated single cell data sets, but then also go back to public data sets in a larger number of patients, maybe not in the same resolution, but we can try them collectively to just them to get more robust hypothesis for further analysis. Yeah, with that I'm also coming to an end. So the work I show you as I said is the work of Kisti uh, and Ricardo Ramirez, both of Jovan Koneski and a uh, joint student with Rafael Kraman and Monica Hanani. As I said, it was a very close collaboration with Rafael Kraman's lab in Athens, in particular Christoph Kuper, who generated the data, and with Ivan Costa, with whom we did the bioinformatics, uh, in particular the CD Lee student, and Frederick Milton, who provided the samples. And other members of the lab who developed the tools that we use here, Dennis Today for Omnipath, and Christian Holland, uh, Ovalian Dubo, and Tila Gabos and the other American tools. We have other projects, other collaborations that uh, we will not discuss today. And finally, thanking the funding of different agencies, and in particular the Informatics for Life initiative uh, that uh, also Christoph and, and Benjamin Meller and others locally are involved. And I'll finish with just some take home messages. So, as I tried to illustrate, but also we saw this yesterday in Norbert Sugner's talk and in other cases, so single cell technology really have a new avenues to better understand the molecular basis of heart disease, to really go to step deeper. We can, for example, find new cell types, we can try to understand the molecular functionality, and if we have a special resolution, we can also look at where these different cell types are and how they interact with each other. And this also needs uh, computational methods. Uh, I try to make the point that uh, there is value in combining biological knowledge with machine learning and artificial intelligence. In particular, if you have RNA, to try to think of this as a footprint, as, as, as the output of a certain process of interest. And there are these resources on the path where it's a one-stop shop for a lot of biological knowledge that is also freely available. In the particular context of spatial data, which is very novel, it's very exciting, but also there are a number of challenges for bioinformaticians. Um, but again, here there are strategies we can use, such as the SMISTI approach, where we try to uh, yeah, look at the different interactions between different spots in the tissue. And with that, I'd like to finish and thank you for the attention. Hi, Julio. Thank you very much for this brilliant talk, um, uh, introducing us again to uh, new signal cell technologies with the spatial aspect. So let me uh, start off with uh, basically firing a question at you already. Um, so, so you mentioned that basically um, you can increase the, the resolution, um, the value gain of spatial transcriptomics data by incorporating prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. so, so how is your approach, I mean what are the key elements that are different say to um, other knowledge databases in that context like cell phone? DB from Sarah Yeah, so cell phone DB we also use, it's complementary. Yeah. I mean, what I saw today is how we look at intracellular pathways, mm -hmm. and cell phone DB tells you intercellular interactions. And in fact, yeah, I didn't get into that, but we also use it. Mm -hmm. And through this Omnipath, we have all the cell phone DB knowledge, but also there are other related uh, databases. Uh, but yeah, there is also, for example, MishNet, which is also combines actually both intra and intercellular, and there is a number of methods. Are um, yeah, for some things we use our own, for some things we use cell phone DB or other ones. But I think exactly that's one of the powers of single cell data is that you can really look at cell cell interactions. Cell phone DB or most methods, they don't use explicitly the spatial location, but we and others are trying to think how to do this. Um, and in terms of the myocardial infarction border zone that you're studying, I mean, so how many, I mean, how many cells reside in one spot? What do you typically encounter? So it's around maybe 10 or up to 10. Uh, and that's an important thing to keep in mind no? when you can be single cells. And that's why you need to um, 
yeah, it, it's like if you single cell or not, it's a group of cells. Uh, and that's uh, another important thing is that actually the spots are not strictly adjacent. So the way technology works, uh, so, you know, there is some caps in the yes. cell. And that's why these more imaging based technologies you do get the single cell resolution, but you have to remark and errors. Okay, so uh, let me check for the questions from the remote audience. There are currently none. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, that doesn't seem to be the case. So I think we are doing actually very good with time. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, if, if there are no further questions, uh, then we have a third one, sure. uh, essentially. Um, so in terms of, um, you, you were already relating to that, in terms of the single cell spatial approaches, there are different technologies entertained. Um, so one could also take particular representative genes of a cell type with a certain identity and do something like a fish uh, yeah. experiment, presumably. Um, so did you also try that? And how, where do you see the pros and cons of this? Yeah, not in this study, yeah. but that's often done also as a validation. Um, and I think, yeah, like, the limitation there is you need to present like the genes. So uh, either you have very good knowledge or you may miss it. That's the limitation, but the value is to do that with actual single cell. And these technologies are also now different variants that increase the uh, multiplex in the coverage. So I think we have to kind of spend an interesting time to see how the thing will be also combinations of both. Uh, but yeah, for now, it's, I would say we use it either more as a validation or what people also do and we also did a bit is that if you pick good markers you can also use them as anchors to project basically single cell data that is not uh, uh, specially located right so if you have good markers then you can use the mark yes. and this can also be done it's for few years back already by Joe Marioni and Scott Rodriguez and Bajewski this many people is also in that way the yeah. individual markers right the, it's just an anchor yeah. okay so I don't see any further questions then I would like to thank you all um, for this excellent presentation and thank you for joining us and we'll be back shortly